I went to the University of Maine and we had our psychiatric nursing experience at Boston State Hospital. Our instructor was an old MGH grad. And she kept after my roommate and myself that we needed to interview at Nash General. And Jean and I interviewed and we got the job right away. My experience with the nurses that I met and the doctors was so different from Maine. I don't know how to explain um, a place that felt so comfortable. When I first came, I heard that it was like a family, and I was like, sure. And uh, that was what it was. When you walked into a nurse's station, everybody spoke. Um, I noticed that the doctors even spoke to um, people that were in environmental service, people that were dietary. Um, it just became friends with everybody. It was just natural. And in Bangor, if you didn't stand when a doctor came, you were punished. <laughs> so, and I noticed no one did that here. Everybody was um, friendly and there wasn't any, what seemed like a hierarchy. And that meant a lot to me. In 1955, I was in my third year at Harvard College I decided to look for some kind of research position and I knew of Mass General so I applied there for a position which Mandel Cohen, a neuropsychiatrist, wanted to have some inexperienced person who could shadow him and do a chart review for him. So for three weeks I did that and it made up my mind that I wanted to go into medicine. It also made up my mind that if I could, I'd come to Mass General. During uh, the almost end of 50 years at the MGH, during uh, radiology rounds in the medical intensive care unit, I noticed this very excited young pulmonologist sitting next to me, and I was struck by her very dark hair. And I looked at her name tag and noticed that her name was Black. And for some reason I thought, well, maybe this is the daughter of Mandel Cohen, uh, who married Peter Black, who was a neurosurgeon at the Brigham. And she said, no, she wasn't the daughter of Mandel Cohen, but she was the granddaughter of Mandel Cohen. And it made me feel that this is a continuum, and it indicates the chain of existence that'll never end. I found that some predecessor had left a copy of an old New England Journal of Medicine. And in it, there was an article about how Sjogren's syndrome and Michalik syndrome were really the same. I considered the article to represent the extreme of medical esoterica. But when I was subsequently at the National Institutes of Health, I presented a journal club on Sjogren's syndrome. Dr. Joseph Bunum, the director, was in the audience, and um, he too thought that it was fascinating that American rheumatologists um, were largely unaware of Sjogren's work. He initiated a study over the course of um, three years, I was able to collect about 62 patients with this disorder. The study was uh, reported in several publications, the largest one being in medicine in 1965. This um, article did serve its purpose of familiarizing American rheumatologists with Sjogren's syndrome and um, came to be recognized as a medical classic. Well, I was a New Yorker. I grew up in Brooklyn and had education at a fine public high school, managed to get to Princeton University. And uh, then it came time to apply to medical school and was accepted at, uh, still in New York, Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. And at that time, when the MATCH program came along, 
Everybody talked about the Mass General Hospital, and I was overjoyed to be accepted here. The program was a very, very intense one. We were on every other night, every other weekend. Uh, when my wife gave birth to twins in my second year, uh, I would come home virtually fall asleep and let her take care of <laughs> all that needed to be done. As intense as the program was, it was an incredible growth experience. We were locked into patient care and tried to maintain the highest standards that were set by Walter Bauer, who was my chief of medicine. Beyond that, it was the camaraderie of the people that were in my program. I. Uh, uh, restored a friendship with Sam Thier, who grew up in my neighborhood. We went to the same schools, and there he was an intern, and we've been fast friends ever since. Um, that was a bonus, but it was um, it was a great experience, but uh, one that will never be duplicated today. Now that it's in every fourth night rotation. <laughs> Early in my career, there was a an event called the Great Boston Kite Festival. And I went there and got very intrigued. I then wanted to do more kite flying. And of course, it was not really acceptable for an adult to fly kites by himself. So I dragged my poor children along. And I think they kind of got interested in it also. Our crowning achievement was making a six-foot denim winged box kite and this was flown on 200 pound test line and could lift our, my kids uh, off the ground. We finished it about 10 at night and we couldn't wait so we raced to Lars Anderson Park and started flying the kites and the police came along and asked us what in the world we were doing and we tried to show it to them. It was dark so they couldn't see too much and they suggested very strongly that we take it down and get out of the park, which was closed. I don't fly that many kites anymore, but I always keep one in my car. And if I happen to see a good wind in a nice place, I'll pull it over and hoist a kite. Leukemia was the worst diagnosis in 1960 that a child and a parent could ever be confronted with. The mortality was 100%. There was no, no escaping it. By the end of the late 60s, the inevitability of it seemed to be in question. And by 1971, it was projected statistically that there may actually be a cure rate, and that cure rate may be as high as 50%. The majority of children with cancer to this day are treated on randomized clinical trials. And this could occur because of the family's understanding that what happen to their child would be useful to the next children who came along with exactly the same problem. Subsequently, through good management and good luck, that cure rate inched up from 50 to 55, 60, 70, 80, 85 percent. Can you imagine going from zero to 85 or 90 percent within one professional lifetime. It has been simply glorious. I salute all of the families who allowed us to do what we felt was necessary, which in retrospect was necessary, and they gave us the gift of curability of a hitherto absolutely incurable situation. My brother was uh, a resident in medicine, and I was a resident in surgery. He was engaged to a nurse who was a teacher and was teaching the Simmons students. And so my brother said, you know, your birthday is coming up in January. Let's go out to dinner, get a date. I said, great. You see that girl walking down the hall? You get me a date with her. She was a student nurse. She went to Simmons College in the five-year Bachelor of Science degree in nursing, and they did their nursing training at the MGH. It turned out, I have a wonderful wife. We've been married 54 years. That's where probably is going to last, right? I don't think young people realize how important it is who you marry. 
they really don't realize. And I didn't either. I mean, I went out with her, she's great, she's pretty, she's very attractive, very intelligent. You know, I was getting to be 31 years old, guess I ought to get married. And I told her before we got married, I said, you have to understand, I'm always going to work harder than anybody else. She said, oh, that's fine. There's so much luck in life. There is so much luck in life. The essence of medicine still, to me, is the interaction between the doctor and the patient. And it's a very uh, warm and it's a very personal interaction and it's a very important interaction. In any given visit, I invariably try to ask about part of a patient's life that is independent of the medical aspects of it, something personal, something in, with respect to their family. There's a scientific medical part and there's a humanistic part. And unfortunately, the way medicine is progressing at the present time, it's harder and harder to preserve humanism uh, in the practice of medicine because you're concerned with computers and information and short visits. I was blessed by the fact that I was a period of time when I did have time to talk to patients. But I always tell my, the people that I train, in any given encounter, try to at least introduce an element of humanism. It's very, very important. In the mid-80s, I went to a lab of a former student of mine to learn molecular biology. And uh, it was in the National Cancer Institute. And when I came back to the MGH, I concluded we weren't doing enough in the field of cancer. The word got to the trustees, and uh, finally they said, would you be willing to develop the cancer center at the MGH? I took up the challenge, and one of the key components was, where would this take place? Uh, and it turned out if, uh, the father of a patient was developing this site in Charlestown. The key to me was that the amount of space per floor was 60,000 square feet. And when you think about it, there's a big difference between one floor of 60,000 versus six floors of 10,000. You normally don't go up from one floor to the next. But if you're all on one floor, you have a lot of interaction. Now I realize this was a big change here. I'm suggesting a whole new campus. It changes the whole setup of the MGH. But I felt if the MGH was going to do anything, I couldn't wait to tear down a building here on the main campus and then wait another three years until the building went up. The timing was critical. So that's what was done. Uh, and the rest is history.